Okay, I managed to start recording, I think. All right, hello everybody. Is everybody doing okay? <clears throat> so given the, uh, um, the, the shelter in place policy, so we all have to stay home. And uh, uh, this is my first time trying to uh, give a lecture from home. So uh, everything is again experiment. And so given that I don't have access to a big blackboard anymore, uh, I uh, uh, try to put together slides uh, so that you can actually uh, see the slides together with me. And I already posted the PDF version of the slides on B courses under syllabus. And so if you go to the place where you can find the Zoom link to this lecture right now, uh, there's another link next to it, it says uh, March 17, and, and that's the link for the PDF file. So uh, uh, if you want to actually uh, go back and forth freely while I give a lecture, then you're welcome to download this. And, and so uh, uh, let's see how that works. And I'm also trying to uh, respond to your questions uh, if you know they're using the uh, the, the whiteboard uh, uh, option uh, on Zoom, and I've never used it before. So again, uh, I don't know how how well that is going to work. But anyway, so uh, that's another thing we are uh, trying out today. Uh, probably some of you have already used it for uh, 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 teaching sections and stuff. So uh, uh, if you actually have advice, I, I'd be happy to hear about that too. So anyway, so let us get started. <coughs> so I am now trying to share my screen so that I can show slides. Okay. Uh, can you see this? My slide? Yep, looks great. Okay, all right. So uh, let's go then, uh, 232B. So uh, first, logistics. I, I already said this. I, I can't come into classroom anymore, so I can't have a big blackboard at my disposal. So I, I, I try to put together slides, which turned out to be huge. I want to work, so we'll see how that goes. But anyway, so so that's what I uh, try to do today, and and together with this whiteboard capability of Zoom. So again, we'll see how that goes, and uh, I. My iPad didn't have a uh, Apple Pencil, so I, am, uh, I ended up actually borrowing my wife's iPad Pro. Uh, so she got a much better version than I do, so uh, hopefully that works. Uh, the, there's no class tomorrow, so we uh, used Wednesday slot to make up classes uh, I missed because of some travel, but I have already made up all the classes I missed. So from uh, this Wednesday, uh, I'm not planning on any makeup classes, so no class tomorrow. We will have class on Thursday as uh, usual from uh, 9.40. So we do have office hour today uh, at 5 p.m. Again, there's a Loom link posted under syllabus on B courses. So click on that and join in. And, and I hope uh, everybody stays safe and, and uh, uh, they're healthy. So that's the logistics. So far, any questions? Okay, and I understand there is actually a uh, option to raise hand uh, in, in Zoom. Do you guys know how to use it? I actually don't. Does anybody, can any of you tell us how to use, oh yeah, I, I do see people raising hands. Okay, now I see it. So uh, that's the way uh, I can actually call on you. So if you have any questions in the middle of my uh, 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 lecture, then please raise your hand. And I also try to stop uh, at the transition of every a new slide because using slides there's a typical problem that I tend to go too fast and so I try to go as slowly as possible and but if I still go too fast again raise your hand or we'll speak up and, and let me know okay so get started so we have started to talk about critical phenomena and we observe this very amazing, bizarre fact that if you start with D plus one dimensional system, and if you go close to the critical temperature, then the whole system reduces to one dimension less QFT. And we are trying to use this fact to study many different systems. 
And that's because we can integrate out all the non-zero Matsubara modes, the Matsubara modes are the Fourier modes in the imaginary time direction with a periodicity uh, h bar beta. So uh, each mode has this frequency two pi n over h bar beta where n is an integer. And uh, the, these modes are from the point of view of the one dimensional less d dimensional QFT, they look as if they are massive particles. So their correlation length are short. So the presence of these Matsubara modes can only affect short distance physics, but not the long range behavior. So that's why we can safely integrate all of those modes out. So after integrating out all of these modes out, we are left with the d-dimensional QFT because the remaining zero mode where n is zero uh, is constant in imaginary time direction. So that's how you have effectively lost the imaginary time direction. And that's how you end up with QFT one dimension less. And as you keep integrating out these Matsubara modes, uh, I told you last week that there is a sense called universality because you keep integrating out Matsubara modes and all the parameters in the theory keep changing as you integrate them out. But at the end of the day, uh, you just write down a, uh, the remaining theory uh, in D dimensions, which respect the same symmetry as you originally started out with. So uh, even though you integrate out these infinite number of modes on the way to reach this D dimensional QFT, then the end result should be basically dictated by the symmetry of the system. So uh, that's why we uh, end up with a some kind of Lagrangian which is sort of useful and easy for us to deal with. And that's how we uh, try to use this uh, Owen linear sigma models uh, for uh, many different systems. So uh, we, for example, can start with the Ising model. Uh, Ising model actually corresponds to n equal one linear sigma model. So uh, if you picture this uh, uh, double world potential, so uh, if you have O n with n uh, equal to and, and above, then you have this additional rotational symmetry of the potential. But uh, if you have only a, a n equal one, then O one is the same thing as Z two because it's just a double world potential because you don't have this axial symmetry. So the, what actually comes out to be this double world potential is that you have two minima where all the spins are oriented in this say positive Z direction versus negative Z direction. So the spins basically can point into only two directions instead of a continuous uh, uh, possibilities. So that's basically correspond to the same symmetry as the Ising model where each spin is only the Z direction of the spin which takes values plus s, plus one half and minus one half. So the uh, n equal one case, therefore, corresponds to the Ising model. So at least they share the same symmetry. So based on this idea of the universality, if you study this O1 linear sigma model, then that should correspond to the same universality class of uh, uh, Ising model. So we say many different theories end up being the same QFT uh, near the, at a critical temperature. And then we say they belong to the same universality class. So that's the terminology. Okay. And n equal two case will correspond to x, y model. So you actually are looking at this model in the, the first half of the uh, homework problem. And uh, oh, no, no, that was a previous homework, I'm sorry. So in this case, uh, x, y model uh, basically corresponds to a system of spins uh, for the x component and y component. And they interact on the nearest neighbor. And uh, we, you actually go to the Lagrangian so that you can deal with this Lagrangian at the classical level. And then you lose this time direction, which has the weird this uh, uh, the term in the first order time derivative. You lose that anyway. So at the end of the day, you find a QFT in, in, in D dimension where SX and SY are the only degrees of freedom which commute with each other now because you have lots of time direction, there's no canonical quantization. And therefore, that is a model of basically spin uh, that moves around in the planar uh, uh, orientation. So that's what, what the XY model is about. And one of the, the famous work uh, along this line is the work by Kostolitz and Taulas, uh, who are uh, the joint Nobel laureates a couple of years ago on how to apply topological arguments to condensed matter systems. And so this is the, the example of that model. And in the same universality class, I also mentioned last week that, that uh, the D-dimensional superfluid uh, would behave the same way. 
So superfluid is described by a non-relativistic Schrodinger field, where field has now expectation value that corresponds to Bose-Einstein condensate. And the phase of this field is arbitrary. There's a U1 symmetry, namely changing the phase of the field is a, a symmetry of the system. And I mentioned that uh, the, the changing phase uh, is a symmetry, therefore leads to conservation law. The conserved quantity associated with the symmetry is the number of particles. And so uh, if you rewrite this uh, field with a, a complex phase as a real part and imaginary part, that uh, ends up being exactly the same thing as O2 symmetry of rotating between the real axis and imaginary axis. So that's why the XY model of spin in X, X, SX and SY direction and superfluid, whose field is complex and therefore in a complex plane, uh, you can rotate arbitrarily and on, on complex plane by phase transformation, they are supposed to belong to the same universality class. And that's already a very non-trivial statement because totally different systems of let's say gas of cold atoms that becomes superfluid with the BEC, and the system of spins in the planar direction behave the same way uh, at the critical temperature. So that's a, a very non-trivial statement, but that's something we believe, and uh, so that's one example of universality. And if you go to the N equal three, and that's the classic Heisenberg models, and uh, uh, that's true both for the ferromagnet and the antiferromagnet, because um, the sign of the Hamiltonian are the opposite for ferromagnet and antiferromagnet. And, and you cannot change that uh, from one to another because commutation relations among the spins know about how you define the spin operator. And if you try to, for example, uh, flip the sign of spins at odd lattice points, odd lattice sites, to try to convert antiferromagnet to ferromagnet, then the computation relation among the spin operators gets screwed up because SX, X, SY commutator, maybe this is the point I can try to use the, um, uh, 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 the white board. Let me stop share this and share white board. So what I'm saying is that if you have a lot of points, this is even, odd, even, odd, and for antiferromagnet, they are anti-aligned, something like this. And uh, you have spin coupled to the nearest neighbor spin with a positive sign, so that anti-aligned spins have a lower energy. So one way to try to convert this to the same Hamiltonian as the ferromagnet then what you can do is try to keep the same spin operator at even sites, but flip the sign of the spin operator at odd sites, <clears throat> then at the face value, it looks like you can convert the, the, um, the, the, uh, the Hamiltonian of the antiferromagnet to that of ferromagnet. But if you actually flip the sign of these uh, spin operators, that actually screws up the commutation relations among them because SX, SY commutator is ISZ and not negative ISZ. So uh, uh, given these commutation relations, then you will not, we are not allowed to switch the sign of spin operators in odd lattice sites, and therefore antiferromagnet and ferromagnet are indeed very different. And we talked about this fact uh, when we talked about the Gaussian theorem. So for the ferromagnet, you have actually only one gallstone, but for antiferromagnet, you have two gallstones. And the linear the dispersion relation is also different. For ferromagnet, you have a quadratic dispersion relation. The energy of the goldstone called magnon. So it's, it's a, a some particle excitation of the magnet, so it's called magnon. The, the, the dispersion relation of the magnon is that energy goes like momentum squared. On the other hand, for the antiferromagnet, it goes like linear, uh, just like what Goldstone's theorem says. <clears throat> so at the quantum level, they are definitely very different systems. 
But once you actually lose imaginary time direction, then you lose canonical commutation relation because Sx, Sy, Sz all become classical variables you in, uh, integrate over in the classical statistical mechanics fashion. And therefore, uh, the, you can then now allow to flip the signs of the spins and odd lattice sites and move from antiferromagnet to ferromagnet and vice versa. So you expect the antiferromagnet and ferromagnet to be in the same universality class. Uh, at a finite temperature. So that's again a very non trivial statement uh, which goes through this argument of uh, integrating out the Mats Borough modes and uh, resulting d dimensional, one dimensional less QFT only knows about the symmetry of the system. So uh, ferromagnet and antiferromagnet, therefore, is expected to have the same universality class. So let me stop share and go back to the slides. Now I'm not finding the slides. Okay. Oh, what's going on? Share. Ah, now it's back. So that's the idea that uh, these systems are all described by the same nonlinear sigma model, and n equal three case you should describe both ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic systems. Okay, so I stop here. Any questions? Okay, nobody's raising hand, so uh, let me uh, continue on. <clears throat> and uh, this is the approach we are taking. So uh, the, in realistic systems, which you can study in a laboratory, if you have a bulk system, then it's three spatial dimensional systems. So you start out with three plus one dimensional QFT, and you go through this process of integrating out the imaginary time direction, you end up with a three dimensional QFT. So I put these uh, crosses uh, along the horizontal axis in three dimensions with n equal one, two, and three. So Eisen uh, XY model, and the Heisenberg model. So uh, uh, the, in the same way, if you build a system uh, which, which has only uh, the, 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 um, the two-dimensional, so it's actually sort of thin film, for example, and you can really build these systems and you can do experiments with the thin film or superfluid, for instance, and then you're talking about two spatial dimensions of the system. So you use this uh, two-dimensional QFT, and again, n equal one, two, three, so they correspond to real systems you can study in the laboratory. And, and uh, what we have uh, discussed uh, last week is to start doing a perturbation theory using linear sigma model uh, from the four dimension by expanding in epsilon. So uh, uh, we take the space, um, uh, the spatial direction d to be four minus two epsilon. And when you uh, do the expansion in epsilon, we did find this version with some Fisher fixed point, and therefore the coupling constant actually stops running. And as long as epsilon is small, this fixed point coupling was small as well, so we, we could trust the perturbation theory. So we believe that there is indeed such a fixed point. And, and uh, the crazy idea was that you extrapolate that the calculation to actually uh, epsilon going to uh, one half. Then fixed point coupling is actually order one. So it's not clear whether you trust perturbation theory at all. But it turned out that by comparing to the, the numerical simulations, the end result turned out to be pretty good uh, in this uh, rather crazy way of studying it. So that's what is called the epsilon expansion. So that's what we did the last week. So we approach this realistic three-dimensional systems now perturbing around the four dimension. But given that uh, it's, it's clearly beyond the validity of perturbation theory, it's not clear how much we believe that result on the existence of this uh, infrared fixed point. Uh, so we would like to come up with a better ways of actually uh, discussing this. And that's the subject of uh, our lecture today. And uh, uh, so that's, uh, I'm actually going wrong order. This is one of N expansion. So this nonlinear uh, linear sigma model has this O-N symmetry and n equal one to three correspond to physical the systems we can really create and study. But uh, from the point of view of the QFT, it is completely okay to study the n as an arbitrary integer. 
And in fact, we can consider a limit where n goes to infinity. And it turns out that when you consider n to be infinity, the system is exactly solvable. It's an it's, it's a interacting system, so it it's, uh, has a non-trivial dynamics to it. But nonetheless, n equal going to infinity limit is exactly solvable and, and, and without resorting to perturbation theory. So uh, we have a non-perturbative exact solution to QFT in, in this limit. And then we can uh, further do a systematic expansion in one over n away from that limit. And so that's uh, what we'd like to talk about today. And using this method, you can actually study the n equal infinity limit uh, of the three dimensions or two dimensions. Again, without using epsilon expansion or perturbation theory, and actually for three dimensions, you do find the non-trivial fixed point, IR fixed point. So there is actually a invariant, uh, the scary invariant limit of the system at long distances, and that's something you can uh, see uh, very explicitly. Another way you can study this uh, uh, the diagram is to start with the two dimensions, and at two dimensions you can study something called nonlinear sigma model. I, I will actually define that uh, later. And nonlinear sigma model turns out to be renormalizable at d equal two. And then you can expand in epsilon away from two dimensions to larger uh, dimensions. And that's yet another way of doing epsilon expansion. And then we'll come back and talk about that, I think, uh, to, uh, on, on Thursday. So that's what we are trying to do now. And, and of course, try to really work out systems with these realistic numbers of, let's say, three dimensions and n equal one, two, and three is difficult. But once we convince ourselves that uh, there is this uh, non-trivial infrared fixed point by approaching from all directions, then you do believe that there is now a uh, infrared fixed point for these systems. And then you resort to a totally different technique at the end of the day called conformal field theory. And this is still an evolving subject, and the new technique called the conformal bootstrap had been invented only a, like the last uh, 10 years or so, and, and these systems are now being studied uh, much more precisely using that method, and that's beyond the, uh, the uh, scope of this, this course. But uh, uh, the, the fact that we now believe that there are conformal systems or scale invariant systems by studying these systems approaching from all directions is, is the key step so that we can now uh, uh, jump into a other technique to study these systems. So that's basically the idea of how we are trying to approach this uh, uh, difficult problem at the end of the day. Okay, any questions about this uh, approach? All right, so then we dive into this large n limit. So the ON linear sigma model has this familiar Lagrangian. It's basically a fight the fourth theory. And I, as an index, runs from 1 to n. And repeated indices are supposed to sum to over. And in this quadric term, phi i, phi i, the sum to over i, the whole thing is squared. So uh, uh, that's the, the ON linear sigma model. So if you view phi i to be n-dimensional column vector, you can rotate that column vector arbitrarily by n by n uh, orthogonal matrix, and, and hence that's the symmetry of this Lagrangian. And, and let me first talk about large n limit rather sloppily first, so that you get at least a, a basic idea on what's going on. So very roughly speaking, from the last term in this uh, Lagrangian, uh, the Feynman rule is little lambda. But we know that if you go to one loop uh, level, then you have diagram like this one, and then for all the internal lines, you have phi running inside the loop, and then you have n species of phi that can run inside the loop. So roughly speaking, this loop diagram would behave like n times lambda squared, right? So you have two vertices, each of them is a little lambda. And if you have n species running inside the loop, you have the same di diagram n times over, and therefore n result looks like n times little lambda squared. So by uh, looking at it this way, then we cannot consistently talk about the limit where n going to infinity. So instead, what we do is to regard this coupling constant little lambda to be an object of order one over n, so that the loop effects actually don't grow. So what we do is to, instead of writing lambda here, I write little lambda over n. 
So you may be wondering why this is not order n uh, square root, but instead of n, you will see in a moment why that is the consistent thing to do so that we can take a well-defined large n limit. So anyway, so here I regarded this coupling constant to be order one over n. So I instead I rewrote it as little lambda over n, so that little lambda now is supposed to stay order one when you take n to infinity. So once you have identified what you would like to keep fixed as you take n going to infinity limit, then here's the Lagrangian. Then Lagrangian is supposed to be integrated over all, all possible phi. So phi is just a dummy variable. So I'm allowed to change the normalization of phi by square root of n. So I substitute square root n times phi into phi in this Lagrangian. <clears throat> then the first term has two powers of phi. So square root n is now squared. So that's order n times this kinetic term. Second mass term also has two powers of phi. So square root n each. So that factors out to be order n up front. And the last term has four powers of phi. So four powers of square root n is one power of n, uh, so the n squared. But I have one over n in uh, uh, downstairs together with the coupling constant. So phi i phi i squared produces a factor of n squared, and there's one over n already there. So overall, there's a factor of n, which I factor out. So looking at it this way, then your Lagrangian uh, is proportional to n for every single term. And that gives us the hope that this system may be exactly solvable. Because if you consider the integral over all possible phi's, then this Lagrangian integrate over d-dimensional space would go into the exponent, right? And the exponent is supposed to be basically the analog of the action in the original d plus one dimensional theory, which comes with one over h bar. So, so this whole thing is proportional to n and one over h bar. So there is this, this a coefficient in the exponent that goes like n over h bar, meaning that large n limit is the same thing as small h bar limit. And we know that loop expansion was supposed to be uh, expansion in number of loops, uh, h bar, the powers of h bar. So what that says is that the small h bar limit then correspond to basically diagrams without loops. And so basically the tree level which makes sense because small h bar limit is the classical limit where only thing that matters is the equation of motion. So this whole integral over phi now just reduces to the stationary point of this uh, uh, exponent, uh, the, so the, the action. So that's when we believe that there's some uh, huge simplification happening uh, in this limit where n goes to uh, infinity, which is the same thing as h bar going to zero. So that's sort of the rough idea on why large n limit might be a good thing to look at. So any questions about this argument here? Everything okay so far? Okay. But we have made a mistake in this argument though. So it turns out that even when n is large, which corresponds to small h bar, that in principle, you think that you can ignore all the loop diagrams. But we already mentioned the fact that whenever you have a loop, there could be one, uh, the fact of n enhancement because there are n species of the files running inside the loop. So this is a sloppy argument, as I said, uh, I want you uh, uh, ahead of the time. So we have to come up with a more precise argument, how to take the large n limit. So it turns out that the large n limit is not just take the uh, classical action and look for the station conditions of it, but actually there is some additional pieces you need to consider. Then, then you can imagine that things might look a little bit complicated. So let's get started with the simplest diagram. So again, this is the, uh, uh, the, the Lagrangian after scaling phi and scaling lambda. So n is supposed to be sent to infinity at the end of the day, keeping m squared and little lambda fixed. So we consider that limit. And then we better look at the final rule a little bit more carefully. So when you derive the final rule by taking the fourth derivative of this quadric term in the Lagrangian, 
then you take four fields out of this quartic term, and there are three different ways that indices are contracted with each other. So overall, the coupling constant goes like minus two n lambda, because n times this term is the interaction term, so that's the coupling constant. But these four indices of the phi uh, can come with three different combinations of Kronecker delta. So basically, S channel, T channel, U channel, the kind of the idea. So whether these two are the same index and these two are the same index, that's the first term. And second term, as these two, uh, the, the indices are the same and these two indices are the same. And last one is I and L are the same, J and K are the same. So there are these three possible terms uh, in this Feynman rule. And when you develop perturbation theory with it and write down the Feynman diagrams, then the propagator is supposed to be the inverse of the quadratic uh, terms in the Lagrangian. And so quadratic terms in Lagrangian are the these two. And so this is basically p squared plus m squared, but it's multiplied by n. So when you invert the quadratic pieces to obtain the propagator, then you invert n times p plus m squared. So your propagator has a one factor one over n uh, times one over p squared and m squared. That's the uh, familiar Euclidean propagator. So what you see here is that each vertex is order n, each propagator is order 1 over n. So that's the way we're <clears throat> supposed to the counting. And especially that we need to keep track of these uh, the indices, and uh, this is particle physics jargon, uh, this kind of index is often called the flavor index. So in this case, there, there are n flavors in this uh, uh, system. And they, the reason we need to keep track of these flavor indices is that, well, as, as we talked about on the previous slide, when you uh, look at the loop diagram where these phi's are running inside the loop, there may be a factor of an enhancement due to that. So that's why we need to keep track of these flavor indices. To make it easier for us, I look at this Feynman rule and make it look in the following fashion. So the first term in the Feynman rule, I have i and j indices to be the same. So I view this, uh, I, 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 I just, uh, uh, use this notation uh, in, 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 as a Feynman vertex uh, with this a little box in between to separate this line and that line to make sure that I runs into vertex and turns into J. So I and J indices are supposed to be the same. And this box is supposed to separate these two lines to make it clear that flavor indices don't mix over this little box. And on this side, delta KL is that the K comes in going to L, so they have to stay the same index. So this is the way I can represent this first term in the Feynman rule uh, using this little box to make it clear how the flavor indices work uh, in this interaction. So in the same way, if I look at the second term, I and K indices are the same. So using the same box, I can write it this way. So again, I have this box to separate this flow of flavor index from that flow of flavor index. And at the top side, the I flows into K, so I and K are supposed to be the same index. And on, on the, the bottom side, J and L are supposed to be the same index because the flavor indices don't mix across this little box. In the last term is this one, which I'm not drawing very well. And here, this line is supposed to go over that line. They are not crossing. Uh, so I hope you understand that. So I couldn't actually do it better. Um, so again, using this little box, I separated this flow of flavor index from I to L. That's delta I L. And the other flow from J to K, that's the delta J K. So this Feynman rule, uh, is now represented by three different diagrams uh, by putting this little box to separate two lines where each line has a constant flavor index flowing all the way through the vertex. So that's the idea of how to simplify our discussions on counting the powers of n uh, in the large n limit. And so that allows us to actually keep track of powers of n. So first, before considering this additional multiplicity factor of n from uh, the loops, so we know that the vertex has one power of n, one positive power of n, 
So that for any given diagram, that gives me that's power of n to the v. On the other hand, each propagator has the factor of 1 over n. Therefore, uh, you have n to the minus p power coming from every propagator in a given diagram. So as a result, I have an overall power of n to v minus p. And this is where uh, what you have uh, done with this uh, 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 the, the super two degree of freedom uh, in the fight to the sixth theory in three dimension uh, comes in handy. So that experience, uh, I hope you remember this, is that the number of loops in a given diagram is related to the number of vertices and propagators because each propagator comes with its own uh, four momentum or three momentum in this case. And each vertex would give you the momentum conservation so number of independent momenta in any given diagram is P minus V. And number of independent momenta uh, corresponds to how many loop momentum integrals you're supposed to do. So that's why they're related to L, number of loops, except for the fact that overall momentum conservation of the entire diagram is not a free parameter. So you have to actually put that back in. So that's why P minus V, the number of independent momenta in a given diagram, is the same thing as L minus one. So you use this fact in the uh, counting of the degrees of, uh, of divergences in the fight to six theory in three dimensions, and you have proven that that was renormalizable. So, uh, so that's how uh, I get this counting of N going to minus L plus one. But this is the point when I have to stop and think, because as we already talked about, if we have a loop, you may have a factor of n enhancement. So this n to the minus l could be canceled by n to the plus l. Then we have to actually keep track of all these factors of n's in a given diagram. So that's what we'd like to do next on this slide. But before going there, let me stop here uh, to see if there are any questions. Everything OK? Okay, good. Thank you, Nick. So uh, I got the next slide. So now I'd like to see how the factor of enhancements can come from the loop diagrams. So let's look at this diagram. So here I'm using this vertex and I flows to J. So that's delta IJ. And on this side, delta NM, or, uh, or I can say. And then on this side, I'm also using the same vertex that K flows to L and N flows to M. So in this loop, all n capital n species flavors of phi run inside the loop so that gives me a factor of n enhancement and it's important here that there is no uh, 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 mingling of the flavor index outside the loop and flavor index inside the loop because they are cleanly separated by this little box in between if they mix then there is no factor of n enhancement so you'll see an example of that diagram so anyway, so if all of the loops in a given diagram are separated by little boxes on all sides, then each loop would give us a factor of uh, n enhancement. So for this particular diagram, I have one, two vertices. So V is two. And uh, the, they, have, I have, they have two propagators. So P is two. And so uh, the V minus P is zero. That's the same thing as minus L plus one. So this one loop diagram minus one plus one is zero. But overall, this diagram has additional factor of N enhancement because there are N flavors of phi running inside the loop. So that's times N over here. So that's plus one in the exponent. So overall, this diagram is order N. And what we like to do is to keep all diagrams at order n, because if you go back to the Lagrangian, the classical Lagrangian is order n to start with. So we'd like to keep everything that appear as the same order in, uh, in the large n limit. So if a given diagram is order n, like this one, then we'd better keep it. So this is where our initial sloppy argument goes wrong. We said large n limit, corresponds to small h bar limit. Therefore, it corresponds to classical theory and therefore no loops. 
But if the loop gives you this order n enhancement, then of course that's not the case anymore. So this diagram, even though it's a one loop diagram, gives a contribution of order n. That's the same order as the original classical Lagrangian. Therefore, we need to keep this diagram. And so far, it looks simple. But if you try to collect every single diagram, which is order n, you might end up with, with something like this. So here, every loop is separated from external lines by this little box that is kind of separator. So the flavor index inside this loop doesn't mix with the flavor index outside. Therefore, all n species of phi need to be added up in this loop diagram. So this loop has auto n enhancement. And the same is true with every other loops in this diagram. So this loop is also cleanly separated from the rest by these separators. So it's this one, this one, that one, and that one. So every loop in this diagram comes with factor of n because you need to sum over all the n flavors in each of these loops. So as a result, we had this counting of n to v minus p looking at v being order n, p being order one over n, but then every loop is order n in this diagram. So we have additional n to the L factor. And v minus p is minus L plus one, as I talked about uh, on the previous slide, plus L coming from this n to the L enhancement. So number of loops cancel in the exponent. And this diagram is also order n. So I need to keep this diagram. But it's not that I'm keeping every diagram. If I look at this one here, I drop it in the large n limit, because if, I, if you look at this piece here, then this index, flavor index little n, flows into the next loop, because separator is actually in this orientation. So what flowed is as an n index, then flows out as an n index, and the same here, and come back, and then uh, flows out as n index again. So even though this portion of the diagram has two loops in it, I sum over only n flavors once, not twice. So if this separator were oriented this way, so if you can compare these two diagrams, they look almost completely identical, except this orientation of the separator here. So here, this flavor index and this flavor index don't mix. So here I have factor of n, here I have a factor of n. But with this vertical orientation of the separator, then index flows all the way through these two loops. Therefore, I don't have n squared enhancement, but only n enhancement for two loops. So instead of having n squared for these two loops, I get only n for these two loops. So this diagram is suppressed by factor of n. So that's what's shown here. So even though this diagram has one, two, three, four, five, six loops, so uh, n to the six is what we have expected from this argument here. But because the flavor index actually flows the same index in these two loops, the part of this diagram, then I end up getting only n to the fifth enhancement, not sixth. So as a result, this whole diagram goes like n to the zeroth power. It's not enhanced by n. Therefore, relative to the classical piece of the Lagrangian and all of these diagrams, this one is suppressed by one over n. So this is a different way of organizing all these Feynman diagrams. And this is clearly going beyond the perturbation theory. We have to add together all orders in perturbation theory, as you can see. So we can have a large number of loops, large number of vertices and propagators. But as long as each loop is cleanly separated by these little boxes, the separators, then these diagrams all contribute at order n. We have to keep them, all of them. But on the other hand, we can drop certain diagrams where multiple loops share the same flavor index. And so that's the way the one over n expansion is organized. So in principle, we can first start with only the leading terms in order n pieces. 
And then next, we can consider pieces that is suppressed for one power of n, and then two powers of n, and so on and so forth. So that would give us systematic expansions in, in power series in one over n. And, and uh, this is not proven, but it is believed that one over n expansion is actually a convergent series. And it sort of comes with an intuition that n definitely is one or larger. Uh, we are talking about large n, so one over n is a small number. And so one over n expansion is within this uh, radius of convergence of the, the unit radius uh, and in sort of in a strange idea of complex plane of n. It sounds like it's also oxymoron and it's an integer. But if you take that idea, there's this one over n expansion is actually believed to be convergent series. And again, there's no proof about this. But uh, anyway, so uh, uh, that's, uh, that's the idea. But you, you still see that trying to sum over all of these diagrams look like a formidable task, and it may be totally something beyond the control. And I see a chat, okay? It is believed to be convergent. What is hard to prove because it's too ill-defined? Well, it's just that, you know, if you have a theory where you can really solve the system exactly for arbitrary n, then you can actually study this. And I said believed, but it is proven in some cases. And I have a brief discussion about this in lecture notes. If you actually study this, kind of system with O-N symmetry in exactly two dimensions. Again, I can use this additional trick of regarding two-dimensional Euclidean QFD to be a weak roded version of Minkowski one plus one dimensional QFD. Then you're talking about one spatial dimension and one time direction. In those theories, there is a technique called exact S matrices where you can actually prove the scattering uh, that amplitudes, namely S matrix elements, can be predicted exactly for arbitrary n. And if you look at the formulae for the S matrices in this, uh, the, uh, uh, the exact solutions for arbitrary n, there are some complicated uh, combination of gamma functions and stuff, which are all analytic functions. And being analytic functions means you can expand them with arbitrary parameter as an ar of in the argument of those functions. And therefore, one over n expansion can be done analytically. And, and you can also see that n equal one is, is, uh, on the, is really the radius of convergence in those theories. So in those examples, you can prove that one over n expansion is convergent expansion. Away from two dimensions, we do not have exact solution for arbitrary n, and therefore we don't know. So only learning from the experience of exactly solvable two-dimensional uh, O-N theories, uh, you can see that uh, uh, this one of N expansion is convergent. Whether that is true in three dimensions, there is no proof for that. So that's why uh, what I meant when I said it is believed to be convergent. So it's not proven for three-dimensional cases, but we think that is the case because that was true in two-dimensional case where people could actually solve this uh, exactly. And if you look at my lecture notes, there is a small section on exact S matrices where I give some example of the uh, S matrix uh, uh, written out explicitly uh, by some combination of the gamma functions. So you can see uh, 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 with your own eyes that they are analytic functions indeed uh, as a function of N. Okay, I, does that answer your question, Eric? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So now we are still left with this formidable task of how to actually sum over all of these diagrams uh, still at the leading order n. So that's the problem. But if you stay at this diagram for long enough, you notice that if you can think of this little separator to be a propagator of something, and if you view it this way, this diagram is not one pi. Using phi to be the particle, then this diagram is one pi. That's why we intended to keep this. But if you can actually cut this line of the separator so that I regard this little box as a quote-unquote particle in some way, 
then you can see that every single diagram in this large n limit is made of this block. Namely that I have a loop of phi inside and I have this little box sticking outside. You may have four of them for this loop. If I look at this loop, I have two of those. If I look at this one, I have three of those. So if you can add all of these one loop diagrams with an arbitrary number of the boxes sticking out, and I'm afraid this kind of looks like coronavirus, so it's kind of uh, icky. But anyway, so if you manage to sum of all of these diagrams with these boxes sticking out, then you have actually captured all of the leading N effects. So can we actually do this? Namely that it looks like I'm cheating a little bit, right? So I introduced a separator box, just a way of understanding how the flavor index flows in this diagram. But if I'm now allowed to cut this box and regard this to be in an external line of some sort, then all of these leading N diagrams can be made and built out of this block of phi loop with arbitrary number of boxes outside. So it turns out that there is a formal way of justifying this process of regarding this little box to be a particle of some type. And, and that is actually called Hubbard Strat Strat Stratonovich transformation in condensed matter literature. Uh, particle physicists call this just a simple auxiliary field technique. And, and this is a very simple idea, and this is how it goes. So here's the original Lagrangian. But because, you know, the, the way we deal with this uh, uh, QFT is basically just summing over all the fields, I can add additional piece, which is just pure Gaussian which involves this additional field called sigma. And I apologize here that in the lecture note, uh, I'm using the notation chi instead of sigma. I went out putting together slides, for some reason I decided to use sigma as a notation. So uh, they're supposed to mean the same thing. And I think chi is a better notation to avoid a confusion with sigma model, where sigma corresponds to this radial direction in phi space. So I should have used chi instead, but anyway, uh, the, I ended up making slides with sigma as a notation, uh, and so uh, I apologize for that. But anyway, if you integrate over sigma, this Lagrangian is the exponent, this is simple Gaussian integral, and therefore it doesn't do anything. It just adds an overall normalization to the, uh, the, the path integral and doesn't change physics. So this is a sigma integral together with this additional pieces in it, and sigma is meant to be a field, which is a function of space, in this case, d-dimensional space in Euclidean space. And, and so if you integrate over sigma first, then I can shift the integration variable sigma by an amount given by m squared plus lambda phi i phi i. So again, we assume that the measure is shift invariant. Then this whole thing in a parenthesis just becomes sigma, nothing else then this is just a Gaussian integral sigma, which gives you overall constant as a normalization factor of the path integral, which doesn't change physics. And therefore, from line one to line two, I have really not changed anything. But I have chosen this, uh, the, uh, the additional pieces inside parentheses carefully, so that if I expand this, this square, then the, the sum of the terms in the Lagrangian get canceled. So let me go one by one. So because I have three terms in the parentheses, I get six terms altogether out of the expanding this, uh, 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 this, this square. The first one is sigma squared. That's the first term here. And second one is m squared squared. That's the last term here. And I, I put it last because this is just a constant. Uh, so I'm, I don't care the cosmological constant for this discussion. So I'm going to actually drop this at the end of the day. And then comes this lambda phi i phi i squared, and that actually cancels this quadric term. So little lambda is squared over lambda, so I have only one power of lambda left. There's no numerical coefficient here, so this is one over four, and that cancels one over four. And phi i phi i sum over phi i squared is precisely what this quadric term is about. So this quadric term is now canceled. So this is the way of eliminating the interaction term, which is quartic in phi, in favor of this cross term instead, sigma phi i phi i. 
So I took care of all the square terms of each in this uh, square. So now I start looking into the cross terms. So sigma m squared cross term is this term here. So we have to keep it. Sigma phi i phi i cross term is this one here. So we keep it. On the other hand, the cross term between m squared and lambda phi i phi i, again, is designed in a way to exactly cancel this mass term here. So this is now gone, and you can see it. So this little lambda cancels this one over lambda. Two minus signs cancel, so over there's a minus sign. And cross term has factor of two over four, that's the same thing as a half. So that exactly cancels that. So that's how I end up with this Lagrangian in the end. And I dropped the last one, right? So I have a simple enough looking Lagrangian where sigma is now a field. But this field sigma now couples to phi i phi i, which means that that's, oops, I'm sorry, that's this part of the Feynman vertex where ij is a flow of index i to j. Now coupled to sigma, and this box is now understood as a sigma propagator. And sigma propagator is the inverse of the quadratic term in sigma. So that's two lambda over n, remember I take second derivative, so factor of two comes out of this power. So one over two lambda times n is the coefficient, and you take the inverse. So this little box is now a propagator, which is two lambda over n. And at the end of this propagator, the sigma now couples to phi k, phi k. So by rewriting the Lagrangian without changing physics at all, I managed to turn this little box into a propagator of a field. So having done this, then cutting this box, because it's a, not a 1PI diagram anymore, uh, and, and, and keep the, this box as an external line, it becomes allowed. Then what I tried to tell you on the previous slide is something that became possible now. So I can consider all diagrams with phi running inside the loop, with this sigma sticking out, and I can have an average number of sigma around this loop. And summing over average number of sigma is something we have done already by using this effective potential technique, namely that here, looking at the phi, this is the kinetic term, and sigma basically looks like a mass term for phi, which in principle may be space dependent mass term. And so all you have to do then is to take this p squared plus sigma as the quadratic term of the phi Lagrangian. And the whole Lagrangian is actually quadratic in phi, so that's all there is. There's no further higher power in phi in this Lagrangian anymore. So this p squared plus sigma gives you the determinant raised to minus one half power for each flavor. Therefore, overall determinant comes with minus n over two power. And that's something you can compute. We have done this already. So by doing so, I get correction to this Lagrangian by the determinant that depends on sigma. But once you have this building block of sigma external line, I have sigma propagator in the resulting 1p effective action. So I can glue this building block many times over and to build up this entire diagram at the end of the day to compute arbitrary scattering amplitude among phi's. So in this case, I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 external phi's. And this 14 point scattering amplitude can be computed using this piece in yellow as the 1PI diagram as the building block. So for the purpose of writing down 1PI effective action, then this whole diagram is not included because it's not 1PI. All I need to do is to include this piece in yellow square, which isn't a 1PI diagram by regarding this, uh, this box as an external line sigma. So that's the way I can keep track of all the leading orders in the N using a simple one loop diagram. So this is the major part of the trick we're using to be able to compute the larger limit of this theory. 
So this clearly is a, a little bit non-trivial part and might be confusing. So let me stop here again. So uh, you are staring at this uh, uh, Hubbard Stratovich, uh, Stratonovich transformation or sigma is called auxiliary field because you know sigma doesn't have actual dynamics. There's no derivative of sigma in this Lagrangian. This propagator is just a constant. There's no P dependence in it. So in, 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 in physical space, this is delta function because there's no p-dependence. So if you do a Fourier transform of a constant in momentum space to the position space, the Fourier transform of the constant is a delta function. So this vertex and that vertex are the same space-time positions. So there's really nothing propagating from this vertex to that vertex. So, but we call this propagator anyway, because the inverse of the quadratic term, uh, which doesn't propagate, it doesn't go to any different point in space time, but nonetheless, we can regard this as a propagator so that we can go through this argument of keeping only one PI diagram, where P, remember, is particle. So we now regard sigma to be particle. So one particle reducible, meaning that I cut the sigma propagator, and then identifying only the one PI diagrams after cutting all the sigma propagators. And that's something we can do. We know how to do it. All right, questions? Uh, um, I have a chat. Does the linear term in sigma affect anything? Yes, it does. So when you integrate over sigma, then the only thing we need is this phi kinetic term in this interaction with sigma, and that's how you get this uh, yellow box. But we keep, of course, this one and that one in the 1p effective action. And m squared, remember, corresponds to t minus tc. So when we consider how various physical observables depend on t minus tc to understand the critical exponents in this theory, we definitely rely on this linear term in sigma. Okay. So does that answer the question uh, from Chao? Chao? Oh, yes, thank you. OK, good. Any more questions? Um, uh, so when, when, after we integrate out phi, we end up with a, a, a nonlinear theory for, for sigma, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it, what, right. how, how, how does this, does this, does that, do, like, in what sense is it exactly solved? Like, it doesn't turn out that that nonlinear theory is especially yeah. solvable? Right. So it, it becomes exactly solvable, which uh, appears in a couple of slides for now. Let me show that to okay. you. So uh, at the end of the day, the, what is at the bottom is what we have as the 1p effective action. But remember, the whole thing is order n. And we have now made sure that all the order n diagrams are included, including this loop. So this is now the complete order n pieces as a one PI effective action. And given that n is going to infinity, a large n limit, then at this stage, I can finally declare that large n limit is the same thing as small h bar limit, but together with this additional piece coming from determinant, so all we care about now is the stationary conditions of this whole thing in the square brackets, including this piece. So large n limit is exactly solvable in the sense that we can identify the correct ground state just by looking at the stationary condition of this whole thing in, in square brackets. Mm -hmm. okay. so even though it's a nonlinear theory, in that sense, we can exactly solve it. I see, I see. Thank you. Okay, now going back to this. So any further questions about this? So I would rewrite the homework problem part two so that you go through this argument yourself on the power counting in N to convince yourself that this is indeed the correct thing to do. So in the homework problem, my plan is to give you this Lagrangian and you do this how about starting with transformation and just basically expand the square to convince yourself that this is the Lagrangian. Then use this Lagrangian, you identify sigma propagator, which is one over n because it's the inverse of the quadratic term. Sigma phi phi vertex, that's order n. And then you go through the power counting in n. So that's indeed what I try to do here. 
and uh, I'm sorry, I hit here. So the sigma propagator is the coefficient of the quadratic term in sigma inverted. So that's one over n. Vertex is this one, sigma phi phi vertex. That's order n. So these are the powers in n. So, and I can actually look at the simple diagram where sigma is exchanged, right? And then I use this vertex and same vertex here together with this propagator. So I have n vertex, n vertex, one over n propagator. The whole thing is order n. And dependence on a coupling little lambda is two lambda from the propagator, not from the vertex. So that's two lambda there. And the flow of flavor index is I to J on this side, that's delta IJ, and K to L on this side, that's delta KL. So that's how you build this diagram, which is now not the fundamental, uh, the, the, the Feynman uh, vertex, but rather a consequence of using two vertices and one propagator. And this is exactly the same result as we had with the original, uh, the language of using phi's alone. And then you exchange this sigma in also T channel and U channel to get two other terms, which we had in the original Feynman vertex. That's how you recover everything we knew. And then we go through the same power counting, and that will be a part of the homework problem. And looking at this diagram now in the yellow box, then I do have number of vertices, each of that vertex, which is this phi phi sigma vertex, that goes like uh, one of uh, uh, n. And I don't use sigma propagator, so I don't have um, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the one of n from sigma propagator. But phi propagator is also one of n, and I should have actually written that here as well, because kinetic term of phi, together with, even with the quote unquote mass term is order n. So inverse of that is one over n. So each propagator is still one over n for this phi loop. And there's an overall n enhancement for each loop. So this counting uh, is, is still true. So uh, everything remains the same, except for the fact that now we are allowed to cut the sigma line and that's the main change. And so what we also learn is that if you look at this diagram, What's different from this diagram is that if I consider these two loops to be one PI by cutting these external sigma lines, but cutting this sigma line doesn't make it uh, a, a, a disconnected diagram because it's now inside the loop. So I should consider these two loops to be a one PI diagram. And this one PI diagram then has a sigma propagator inside the loop. So what you learn from this uh, example is that if you have sigma inside the loop, that will give you a contribution suppressed by one over n. So what we have to then talk about is sigma always being external lines, never on an internal line, to keep track of the leading end behavior of the theory. So that's why we are confident with this uh, idea of keeping sigma only as an external line, we never ever consider sigma as an internal line for the purpose of keeping track of leading end behaviors. And because sigma is an external line, the only piece you need to add to this uh, 1p effective action is the phi loop with the sigma sticking out. And that's nothing but this the determinant. Right? So when we talked about the uh, one-loop effective action and especially effective potential, we regarded some external field to be the mass term, part of the mass term. Then we computed the determinant, and that was added to the classical Lagrangian as the full one-loop uh, effective action. Now we are claiming that adding this piece in, which is also order n because that comes from integral over n species of phi, then adding this piece in, this trace of log, which comes from determinant, is the exact result in the large n limit. So that's the statement that we now have an exact result of 1p effective action, which depends both on phi and sigma. Definitely it's a nonlinear theory, but it is actually a, a, a much simpler because we consider large n limit, 
which is the same thing as small h bar limit, because th therefore the only thing we need to do is look for the stationary condition of this 1p effective action. Okay, let me stop here once again and, and pause for questions. Okay, then we jump ahead and, and look into the stationary conditions. So what we have learned over time is to compute this determinant in the case where sigma is a spatial constant. Then sigma is just a number, and this is just a simple uh, the loop integral of the logarithm of p squared plus sigma, a sigma being mass squared of phi in this case. And so I just add this piece in. Then look for the station condition. And phi derivative of this 1p effective action, uh, in the case where everything assumed is space-time constant, is that it comes only from this piece here. That's the only phi dependence we got. Therefore, n over n sigma phi should vanish. So what this means is that if you want to have the ground state with spontaneous symmetry breaking, where phi has a expectation value, then sigma has to be zero. So the question whether symmetry gets broken or not uh, is now uh, has to do with the question whether you can find a station condition where sigma vanishes. So looking for the stationary condition for sigma is then important. So this is a stationary condition for sigma. It has many terms coming from this quadratic piece in sigma, linear piece in sigma, a coupling to phi, and also this new piece coming from determinant. And so this is the equation we are supposed to satisfy. And obviously, it depends on number of dimensions, so we look at each case separately. So let's start with the D4 case. So the same stationary condition we had on a previous slide. Now so specifying this d to be 4 minus 2 epsilon. And this gamma function, of course, has a pole. And I expand this uh, in small uh, epsilon. And so the, the pole, 1 over a epsilon minus gamma plus log 4 pi, uh, comes together with this m squared. So in MS bar scheme, we say this whole thing is now absorbed into m squared. So we normalize the m squared then I don't have any pole anymore. And I have all the other pieces here. Then I ask the question whether this has a, a solution with vanishing sigma. And it certainly does, because sending sigma to zero makes its logarithm singular, but it's multiplied by sigma. So sigma log sigma goes to zero when sigma goes to zero. This certainly goes linearly with, um, to zero uh, with sigma. So only thing in the limit of sigma going to zero is only these two terms surviving. And then you can certainly break symmetry when this renormalized m squared is negative. So this behavior is exactly the same thing as the classical theory. On the other hand, the, in the case of this uh, uh, the uh, m squared exactly zero, so you had this homework problem where one loop effective potential fooled us, thinking that symmetry does get broken even when m squared vanishes. But with this solution, that's not true because when sigma is sent to zero, these two terms vanish. When m squared vanishes, then phi is zero. So for m squared vanishing, then there is no symmetry breaking. So in the case of the one loop effective potential, we summed over all the external lines uh, uh, of phi phi, and, and, but we still have to go through yet additional improvement using the renormalization group argument to convince ourselves that this uh, symmetry breaking minimum was a fake. And we got rid of that fake by using the renormalization group argument. But what you see here is that we don't need to resort to additional improvement. This is already an exact result. And this exact result tells us the symmetry is not broken for vanishing m squared. So you really see that there is some improvement over what we have before in the large end limit. We are very confident on this result. In any way, renormalization group improvement is already built in in this method. So that's one thing we learned from this D equal four case. And this is sort of trivial because we knew the four dimensional theory is trivial anyway. And, and so, but the, the fact that we do recover this trivial result is already an important consistency check of this, due, this uh, one over n expansion. Okay, any questions about this? All right, then we go to dimension two. 
And as we, as we also looked at the homework problem, in two dimension case, the symmetry seems to get restored. And again, you did this with one loop effective action. So you were not quite sure if this is the right answer at the end of the day. So I had to resort to the theorem by Coleman or Merwin Wagner uh, to actually argue that symmetry restoration is supposed to be the right answer. But now that we have an exact result, we should be able to see it. So again, from the same stationary condition with respect to sigma, we do expansion of d being 2 minus 2 epsilon. And again, I have a pole, which can be completely absorbed into this new renormalized uh, mass squared. So this is the condition we get. Now, this log sigma doesn't have, have sigma in front. So sigma going to zero is logarithmic singularity. And when you try to sigma to zero, this log sigma goes to negative infinity with a minus sign of all. So the, this term as a whole is a positive infinity, which means that no matter how negative m squared is, the positive infinity always wins. Therefore, phi i phi i plus something positive can never be zero. So here you conclude the symmetry does never break as we expected from the theory, but now you see this explicitly as a result of this solution. So symmetry does not break, which you can verify explicitly in the large n limit. So any questions about this? Okay. Sorry, I have, a, I have a question. Um, so wait, can you, can you explain again why, why it's correct to look at sigma goes to zero? Sigma going to zero is the way you can find a solution of symmetry breaking. So if you want phi to be non-zero, sigma has to be zero. So if you're asking the question whether there's a minimum with spontaneous symmetry breaking, you are supposed to look at the solution where sigma vanishes. Okay? Okay. All right. So we now recover the fact that sigma uh, uh, cannot be zero. So then you can ask the following question. So now that sigma uh, cannot be zero, then the phi has to be zero. So setting phi to zero, and, and then when you go to small sigma, then this linear term is negligible compared to log term then you can solve the stationary condition where sigma turns out to be this. And sigma, value of sigma, if you go back to this 1p effective action, value of sigma is nothing but mass squared of phi. A mass squared of phi tells you the correlation length in the phi phi two-point correlation function. So that is something of interest already. So n phi squared, which is given by the value of sigma, is now solved in the following form when n squared is negative. So this is mu squared times e to the minus 4 pi absolute value of m squared over lambda. So again, this is the expression we didn't believe before because it's an incessional singularity if you do a power series expansion in lambda. So if you take the Taylor series of this exponential in power in lambda, every coefficient vanishes at arbitrary finite orders in lambda. So that's what essential singularity is. So you can never ever reproduce this behavior from purely perturbative expansion. But given that we now have an exact result, this is something we believe in. And therefore, phi, which we expected to become the Goldstone boson and therefore massless, now has a finite mass squared but that mass squared is exponentially suppressed. And therefore, you have rather long range correlation, but never goes to infinite. And this long range correlation length is actually exponentially longer compared to some fundamental scale in the problem, which is given by the, uh, the this realization scale or cutoff scale. So this is an emergence of the hierarchy that your original physics is described by scale mu, but there emerged long range correlation, which is exponentially longer than the original scale.
So we now expand on this point further when we get to the nonlinear sigma model. But anyway, so let me stop here and, and continue on this discussion. Now moving into three dimensions next, where things become even more non-trivial. Hey, any questions? Okay, good. So I believe I have recorded this. So uh, I, I try to put the video of this uh, session on the uh, 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 on on the courses later, and you also have these slides, which is already there, so you can look at it. And hopefully, the combination would uh, uh, answer most of the questions you might have. And in addition, we have an office hour at five o'clock today. So again, connect to the office hour and then ask any further questions you might have. Okay. And I do have a uh, question from Chao. So this is a necessary but not sufficient condition. So what are you referring to as this? What is necessary but not sufficient? Chao? Maybe he's gone. Okay, so I hope to continue this discussion at the office hour at 5 p.m. later. Okay, bye for now.